Well, that was a nice little 201 frame speedrun. In this video, I'm going to be presenting a method of building a precise custom timer like the one in that level. It was built using a system that lets you easily adjust the length of the timer down to the frame. I am presenting this for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it'll allow people who don't have a bunch of random movement parameters memorized to easily make a precise custom timer, and even for people who are able to do that to begin with, this can still allow them to skip a lot of trial and error in the process of adjusting a custom timer. For example, if you decide you want your timer to be two frames more lenient, you will be able to immediately and easily do that. So let's get started. The basic timer we will be building can be broken into two parts, the tower and the base. We'll begin by talking about the base, which is the bottom of the contraption. This is essentially going to be a machine that gets activated by a muncher falling on a specific part of it, and I'm going to refer to the muncher landing on this part as the activation of the machine. After being activated, it eventually finishes with something happening that makes the level unwinnable. This can be a number of things, such as a POW blowing up, an on-off switch triggering, or a P-switch activating. While I use the word machine, this is allowed to be very simple. For example, it could just be a P-switch, or a bomb next to an on and off switch. It can also be something more complicated like this contraption here. There are several main properties that the base must satisfy, the first two of which I've already mentioned. As noted earlier, it is activated by a falling muncher, and the level becomes unwinnable once the machine finishes. Number three, it must always take the exact same amount of time to finish after activating. For example, you wouldn't want the machine to sometimes take one second to finish, but sometimes take two seconds depending on when the muncher lands on it. Number four, it must always work regardless of where Mario is in the level or current section. For example, you wouldn't want it to fail because Mario scrolled the camera so that a note block that something is supposed to come out of goes off screen. Number five, the time from activation to finishing should be a bit less than the time that it takes to finish the section or level. I generally recommend about a second less. Don't worry too much about the exact details of how long the base takes to finish. This is allowed to be loose. The second part of the timer is going to handle the precision. If possible, I'd recommend having the base as low in the level as you can, because more vertical space gives us a bigger range of timer values we can obtain for several reasons that we will get to later. Also, while I primarily had shorter levels in mind when making this, this can also be used for pretty long sections if you make sure the base loads entirely at the start and remains loaded globally, like the one shown here which eventually squishes the piranha against a wall, and then gives you a key. You want to be pretty careful with these, since it's really easy to accidentally make them either not finish in a consistent amount of time, or not work for all the places that Mario can be in. Now let's get into the second part of the machine, which I call the tower, since it consists of a tall, narrow vertical section. We have four possibilities for the top of the tower, which are all shown and numbered here. They all work by shoving a muncher that's centered in a column into the ceiling, at which point it starts falling, I'm going to let the munchers briefly fall, and then show an image from after they have all reached their maximum falling speed. Note that as we move from left to right, the munchers' positions increase by one-fourth of a block height. As with most objects, the maximum falling speed of a muncher is one-fourth of a block height per frame, so if we had one of these towers over a base and switched it with one of the towers next to it, we would increase or decrease the total length of our custom timer by one frame. You might say, well great, we can cover a specific 4 frame interval, how fantastic. But recall that a muncher falls a block height every 4 frames. If I currently have tower number 4, and I want to make the timer 1 frame more lenient, I can simply copy tower number 1, which is 3 frames stricter than it, and move it up one block. This raised version of tower 1 makes the timer 1 frame more lenient than the timer with tower number 4. If I want to make the timer another frame more lenient, I can raise tower number 2, and so on. Similarly, if I've got tower number 1 and I want to make the timer a frame stricter, I can copy tower number 4 and lower it one block. I can lower tower number 3 a block to make it yet another frame stricter, and so on. So as long as we've got a lot of vertical space to work with over the base, we can precisely hit every frame in a pretty wide time interval with this system of towers. 
Assuming a pretty low base, you can expect to account for every frame over a roughly 1 second range. As a side note, the lower ice blocks pictured should not be level with or lower than the part of the machine that the muncher will land on in order for everything to line up. Let's look at an example of how we might fine-tune a timer. So we've got a situation where Mario comes out of the left pipe, goes into the right pipe, I've got a pretty simple base here, and some tower. Which tower we have doesn't matter too much at the start, and I've got all the towers copied over here for convenience. Let's try to make this pretty strict. First we run through it once and see we have plenty of time to spare, which is pretty typical. Almost always the first thing we do is adjust the height of the tower to get pretty close to what we want before messing with the finer details. It looked to me like we could safely lower the tower by three blocks, so let's do that. Running through this again, it looks like we can have the timer be two frames stricter without hitting the bomb, so let's do that. To make this two frames stricter, we want to switch from tower number four to tower number two. Looking at this in practice, we do see this is the tightest we can get without actually setting off the bomb. Let's see if we can still get through the pipe even if we do set it off. We're going to make the timer one frame stricter, so we switch to tower number one. Now we see that the bomb does blow up, and while you can't see it here, the on-off switch actually does go off on the other end of the pipe, so if we wanted to get as strict as possible without setting off the switch, we would go with the last tower. For now, let's see if we can get any stricter. To make the timer one frame stricter now, we switch to tower number four and lower the height of the tower by a block. Let's see how this plays out. We see that the blocks under us do switch, but we still made it in the pipe, so we're probably not going to be able to get much stricter. Let's still see what we can get away with. Now we replace tower number 4 with tower number 3 at the same height to take off yet another frame. Once again, we successfully make it into the pipe, as odd as that may seem. Let's try taking off another frame, because why not? All we do here is replace tower number 3 with tower number 2. Now, however, we see this is no longer possible. Thus, if we want to make the timer as strict as possible, we would go with tower number 3 at this height. So that's it for this video. It's been an eternity since I've made an informative video where I actually talk about things, so making this has been an experience. If there are any questions or comments about anything, feel free to let me know.